Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. Devoted to the business of purveying food and decanting wines, Food & Wine Radio is a unique program highlighting not food recipes or wine vintages, but how to make a profit while satisfying America's palates. In this competitive but highly rewarding sector, many men and women have made profits while fulfilling a dream. Food & Wine Insider is all about better managing any business involving food & wine. Each week, your co-hosts sit down with successful restaurateurs, food mavens, winery vendors, store owners, food suppliers, and other leaders in the worldwide industry that centers on foodstuff and wine. In frank give-and-take sessions, guests and panelists talk about the business of bringing healthy and pleasurable foods and wines to others. Your Food & Wine radio host, are Ann Daw, former president of the Specialty Food Association, and a longtime food executive who has held senior positions both here and abroad with Kraft Foods and Philip Morris. Don Mazella, a nationally known business commentator. On each show, they invite leaders of the world's culinary and wine industries to share the secrets of their success. Visit us at foodandwineinsider.com. Our next guest is Gary Snow, who heads Table Tree Montana, an award-winning purveyor of, among other drinks, black cherry and red apple juices. He's, they, they, these two have won awards, and uh, I've tried them, the Anne has tried them, and we think they're delicious. Gary, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. I sure appreciate it. It's quite a show you guys have. Well, we we try, but it's guests like you that, that make it all happen. And with that, I turn it over to Anne. Thank you so much, Don. Um, I want to just provide a little bit of background for our audience. Uh, Gary and Susan Snow have a unique product called Table Tree. Um, it's black cherry juice, black cherry culinary sauce, red apple juice, and red apple culinary sauce. If you ever wondered where cherry culled dough. Well, instead of being wasted, Gary and Susan press them into a unique and healthy juice. Gary, tell us a bit about your journey. I know you started out in British Columbia as cherry growers, but now you're in Montana, and as John said, the name of your company is now Table Tree Montana. Talk uh -huh. to us about your journey. Thank you. Well, um, Going back a ways, I'm a suburban city kid from Kansas City, and agriculture was not a part of my life. Fortunately for us, Susan was born and raised in Creston, British Columbia. Her dad had been a fruit grower all his life. His dad was a fruit grower. They've been growing fruit there for over 100 years. And after we got married, I was a musician my whole life. So there again, no tie to agriculture. And that's what brought us to Montana originally. After being here about nine years, and Sue was in administ hospital administration while we were here, then we moved up to her hometown and started farming with the family. And we went up buying the farm from her dad, and after a few years, pretty challenging years in the in the cherry business at that time, the late the first decade of the 2000s, we decided we had to do something to value add especially our secondary fruit, because as a fresh fruit grower and cherries, you can pretty much bank on you're going to have anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of your crop is not going to be just diamond perfect, and all our fruit went export, so it had to be just perfect, and we were routinely throwing away as much as 150, 175,000 pounds of fruit that cost us the same to grow as the stuff that sold and getting nothing for it. So we kind of put our heads together and came up with an idea of how we thought, well, we figured juice was probably the easiest thing to do. And then we came up with a way to do it that was unique in the industry, but we were faced with the fact that there was no commercially available equipment for doing it the way we did. So we had to come up with the concept and the design for the stuff and along the way, we got involved in a competition for commercializing innovative innovative agriculture technology 
in British Columbia that was put on by the British Columbia Innovation Council. And that was a nine-month process that involved a lot of research, and we were survived the first cut from 60 down to 21, and everybody got money to do a business plan. And then at the end of that second phase were the awards in January 2010, and first prize was $250,000 in matching funds. So it was a pretty substantial contest. We took second in it, and we were one of the few farmers that were involved in the thing to start with, and we were the only farmers in the, the last round of eight companies that they narrowed down. So it was quite it was considered quite the newsworthy thing that a farmer did so well in something like that. But that gave us the money to get started. We started small in British Columbia and unfortunately stayed that way because up there agriculture is not, especially BC agriculture is not a real uh, exciting thing for banks. They really don't like it. So we couldn't get, it was hard to get bank financing and then that was a challenging time for the cherry industry. We uh, kind of limped by and in 2012 we had a nice call one morning from a guy from England that we thought was a crank call telling us we'd been shortlisted for best pure juice product in the world and could we come to Barcelona, Spain for the World Juice Awards. And we're thinking, what's this guy after? And we finally said, well, we'll think about it and call you back. And then we made a call to a guy who had some experience with the World Juice Awards. And he said, no, that's the real thing. So we went to Barcelona and we were one of two companies shortlisted. It was us and one of Australia's biggest juice makers. And we won the best juice in the world. And this awards were part of the World Juice Conference, which was the World Juice Conference. It was all the big companies in the world and us, and we were it was, we were just a mom and pop thing, and it was kind of like stand in the corner, don't make eye contact, you know, because they'll eat us or something. So we um, won the award. That gave us a bit of a boost, but still attracting finance was tough. And then the farming, the fortunes of the farm weren't going the best, so we got a decided we were going to get out of farming and just concentrate on the juice, and then we got a call from the Cherry Growers Association in this area here in northwest Montana on Flathead Lake to come down, and we wanted to come back because this is where we had lived before when we were here and our son had been born here, and it was home. All my music work was based down here, and in 2016, we came back. We took us oh, a year and a half to get our plant in place and ready and then we made a small run of juice in a rented facility in 2016 and then this last year we did what for us was quite a large uh, way bigger than we'd ever done before amount of juice but in the industry it was just a you know really nothing it's still really small but it was big for us and that brings us to now you know it's a it's a very it, it's a really phenomenal story because it just shows you how fragile being in an agricultural product can be, especially when Mother Nature doesn't necessarily cooperate when it did in yeah. 2010 when the rains came in British Columbia and all the cherries split. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, your, your, your wife's family had been in the farm for over 100 years, but ultimately you weren't able to sustain the farm but you did pick yourself up and reestablish yourself in Montana um, in this juice business. Um, so, uh, you know, you really sort of made lemonade out of lemons, but really sort of said, you know, was there a way of really bringing a value added product to market when, right. um, you know, versus just selling the commodity, which is kind of the business you were in before? So yeah. I, what I wanted to ask was, what should people know about your process and what makes cherry juice so special? Because I don't think people really appreciate the um, the health benefits of, of the dark cherries, because it's kind of really important the kind of cherries you use. Um, and talk a little bit about the process, what's unique about it, and what makes cherry juice, dark cherry juice, or black cherry juice so special. Well, as to the process, I can't really say a lot about it. It's proprietary, and we kind of jokingly say our secret is we never wash our feet. But um, 
That's not <laughs> helpful. But it, um, the cherries are an amazing anti-inflammatory. They just are tart cherries. My theory is tart cherries had a better press agent than sweet cherries and got on the game a little sooner of promoting the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory. But other than the amount of melatonin in the fruit from our uh, research and studies we've read, really the, there's not much difference, if any, between, at all between the, the dark cherries, the sweet cherries like we use, and the tart cherries. In fact, the dark cherries might be even a little better because the darker the fruit generally, the higher the antioxidant. I'm not a scientist, so you know I won't swear by it, but that's what our research has kind of led us to. And the, our juice, it's not just a anti-inflammatory. It's not just a juice for drinking, which it makes a wonderful juice for drinking, but it's a fabulous ingredient in cooking. We have a 70-page recipe book available of food and beverage recipes using the cherry juice, and it's anywhere from salad to center a plate to dessert on the food thing. And on the beverage side, it, uh, it makes a great cherry lemonade. It's wonderful in, in iced tea or hot tea. It's wonderful in hot chocolate. It's a, in club soda, 7-Up ginger ale. It has its dark side. It does mix very well with all kinds of wine, beer, spirits. And we sell to various bars and restaurants to use in their cocktail recipes. And it just it tastes great, which is really nice that it does. And we owe that to our process. It retains the flavor of the fruit. It retains the color of the fruit. We bottle in glass. So it's shelf-stable. It's pasteurized. It's shelf-stable for years. We have kind of our, what we jokingly refer to as our wine cellar of juice going back to 2009. And we just, there was a fellow here the week before last, and we got it out of a bottle of 2009, and it tasted just like it did the day we made it. So the shelf life is exceptional. We would not have gotten that out of out of plastic bottling. And my wife, Susan, had gone through stage four cancer back in 2006, and that was another reason we chose glass, was it's just, I think, a little safer, a little healthier, because you're not dealing with the plastic, and stuff can kind of leach through plastic. And it just it made for what we felt was a healthier product. Right. Can you tell uh, tell our uh, listeners a little bit about how many bottles of table tree juice you're able to make now, and how many cherries does it take to make a bottle? Well, it takes about a pound of cherries for a, one of our eight and a half ounce bottles, and then we also do a twenty five point four ounce bottle that's that's roughly three pounds. What's your production? How many bottles are you making? Well, this last year, and like I say, in the industry, it's just still really small, but for us, it was quite an achievement. We made over 50,000 small bottles, and we did about 6,000 of the big bottles. We have six weeks, approximately, give or take a few days, to do an entire year's inventory because we just deal with fresh fruit. We don't freeze it. We don't make concentrate and then try to make it back into a juice later. So... Our, our time frame is really tight, and we worked for about oh twenty twenty some days. We were doing six days a week, ten hours a day. And we had a crew of twelve, and that's what we that's what we were able to make. It's not a real high volume. So, is there is there a capacity constraint um, in terms of uh, how many bottles you can make? Yeah, it's it's a batch system right now, so it's kind of how many batches we can get in a day. We we did like I say, we did start small, but we our capacity does increase it. And also, as we get a better feel for what we're doing, because last year was like I would say, we got quite a bit more made last year. We had always been working in quite a small space, and it was just two of us, Sue and I, and a friend that did everything for six years before we came down here and the first year we were here it was pretty much much the same formula except it was Sue and I and our son and his fiance 
So last year having a crew and not really knowing how much we could do with additional equipment and additional pe people, you can pro you can make all the projections you want, but until you come to making it, you just really don't know what you're going to get in a day. And, and where do you sell it today? And um, is it possible to expand your capacity? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, all it takes is money, but uh, the, the eternal hunt for that. But um, we're in a couple of good chains, Super One and Rose, Rose Hours up here in the northern Rockies, Pacific Northwest. We sell quite a bit around Montana. We're into Idaho, into Oregon, into Washington. We have sold through our website to all over the place. We still have a list of Canadian stores and chains that we deal with up there that we developed when we were based up there. So, and we're we're talking with brokers and talking with distributors. We didn't really have enough pr production to really interest a lot of bigger players before, and we're kind of getting into that realm now to where it's worth their while to talk to us, and it's worth our while to talk to them to see about sure. expanding our distribution. And do you do you sell online at all? We don't have an online course, but we. Well, people can order through the website, and they get hold mm -hmm. of us. We we do get orders like that, and we do sh we send them out. And then, like I say, we sent all over the country, and all over and, Canada, matter. Right. And what's the pricing of your of your product? Uh, the retail price for the small bottles could be anywhere from six ninety nine to twelve dollars, honestly, depending on where they're at. Some of the more touristy areas, of course, are going to be higher. We're in Glacier National Park this year and kind of around the fringes of Yellowstone. And right here in our our economy in the area where we live is quite tourist-based. So some of the stores in the more touristy towns will be, that's where the $12 and $10 mm -hmm. in, in, in towns like that. But in We'd like for people to sell it in the seven to seven fifty range, and for the big bottles, they could be anywhere from fifteen to twenty. For the how do how do you most like to use it? You know, I was I was experimenting with your product in terms of having it either in wine or even drinking it in my water, and and I wasn't quite sure I got the proportions correct. How do you how do you suggest one? How much one needs to put in in with another part, whether it's you know seltzer or juice or whatever. Well, um, like with cherry lemonade, we drink a lot of that. We put about a third to half of one of the small bottles in a pitcher of lemonade, mm -hmm. so that'd be about you know, three to four and a half ounces or or so in a in a pitcher of lemonade. Does it? We had friends with the restaurant up in Canada that serve it. Uh, they call it cherries on the vine, and that that's a half and half mix with their house red wine. Okay. And we're not really drinkers, so we haven't tried a lot of the, you know, trying to balance it out. We have had it mixed in wine, and it's just kind of you mix it to taste. And then for the anti-inflammatory, we it's about an ounce a day for folks that want to use it for that. So and there's no said, really it has melatonin property, so it probably helps sort of regulate your sleep. Actually, not so much because that's where the melatonin. Uh, there's sweet cherries, and it might be a varietal thing too. Don't have a lot of melatonin in them, whereas the tart cherries tend to have more. But uh -huh. one thing it, where it does help sleep, if you're hurting, if you got aches and pains or arthritis, I use it to control my arthritis. And yeah. it's and if you're not hurting at night, you sleep better. And I've used it. We've used it post surgery. It. I. We don't have gout ourselves, but we sell a lot of it to folks for gout and and really a wide ranging anything with inflammation. It can help. It doesn't cure anything, but it can soothe that inflammation and take the discomfort down. Don, I, I don't want to miss you, have, letting you uh, ask some questions because uh, I oh. was like so fascinated by your story. What would you like to uh, uh, ask? 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ann? But the, yes, very well. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Oh, well, uh, Thank you. All I all I know is Gary, you're a amazing, typical Montanan uh, resident. You're uh, uh, forthright, and uh, uh, I love uh, I loved it. Um, uh, I love loved your product. It, 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 it's interesting. I've been using it uh, at night to do exactly what you said to go to sleep at night. And uh, when mm -hmm. I don't use it, I don't notice the difference in sleeping. So. Uh, um, and now I got have to figure out how to get some more of it. But uh, I, I guess um, we have very little time left. I'm just going to ask one or two questions, then turn it back to Ann for the final two. But um, uh, what do you see as the uh, as your future? Do you, do you expect to expand, um, add products? What what Actually, what do you plan? Well, we want to get into other fruits because when we were in Canada, we did a really nice plum juice. But, and then also we did the red apple juice that y'all alluded to earlier, which won a World Juice Award. And we want to do some more stuff with apple. The thing with apple is, it seems like everybody with an apple tree is an apple juice company. So there's quite a bit more competition and, and lower priced competition in the apple. Thing. But we've trialed peach, we've trialed grape, we've trialed blueberry, we've trialed several different fruits, and we uh, have, our, part of our problem here is it's such a narrow focus agriculturally around the lake here, on around Flathead Lake, it's mostly cherry orchards. So we're trying to source sufficient quantities of, of these other fruits to be able to really get back into different fruits, and we've we played around with some native berries here. We made a, we called it a prairie mix last summer that, that was buffalo berry, choke cherry, and currant. That we, we'd like to be able to do some more with that, with the berries. In our future, we do plan to expand. We have had interest in California. We had interest in Canada when we came down here. At the same time, we got the offer from the guys, the growers down here. We got an offer to go to the Okanagan Valley, which is kind of central, south central BC, and that's a big fruit growing area. It's kind of the same area that grows fruit in Washington, just continued on north across the border for a plant there. And we even got a, a email from a company in England that was had heard about us through the folks that market the Northwest cherry crop, and they were interested in. in uh, maybe talking with us about doing something over there with their, because it's a way to capture the value of the secondary fruit. And we would be working with growers every place that we went and taking their secondary fruit and giving them better than what they're getting in the market right now for processing fruit. But yeah, we have, we have grand dreams. We're, we're not young people, so not like we got another 40 years to, to work this thing out, but we do want to expand and we do want to get back into other fruits. Well, that leads to two questions. My first one, when you say offer, did, did the growers come in and say, look, we will uh, guarantee you your crop? What do you mean by an offer? Well, it just, they offered us a place to work. Well, they basically what they did, they offered us the ticket back to Kalispell, back to Montana, because we were gone for 20 years from here spent most of that time really wanting to come back. So as as one door kind of was closing on us in Canada, these guys opened the door to us. They are investors in our business. The, so the Cherry Growers Association has invested in our business. We do lease space from them, but they offered us space in their building. Then we put a 6,000 square foot juicing plant in their building here on Flathead Lake. And that it was kind of a win-win for both of us. And then part of our philosophy in starting this business was, and I always say it ain't just about us because it never has been. We were growers ourselves. We know what it's like to lose you know, a third of your crop and not get anything for it. And if we can help keep growers in business, we watched every winter 
the the growers drop out up there where we were at in Creston, British Columbia. And one year we lost half our growers over the course of the winter that just couldn't afford to do it anymore. And the, losing the money on the secondary fruit was part of it. So if we can help those guys stay in business, that only helps us and anybody else that relies on agriculture product. Because it doesn't matter how many grocery stores you got down the street, somebody's got to grow that stuff. So if we can do our part there, and if that was the offer, like I say, it just kind of offered us a ticket back home and a way to help the growers down here too. Well, uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. You you have a proprietary way of squeezing uh, of squeezing the juice out of the berry uh, out of the cherries that the, uh, that can also be applied. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Yeah, we do. We it's our process works with basically any kind of fruit that we tried, and we haven't tried vegetables. We were thinking when we first started this thing that it probably well we have played a, played around with onion a little bit, and it but it does work for any of the fruits. So you that we have tried. a patent or something? You have a patent? We're working or. On it. Yeah, okay. we're working on. Um, one more question before going back to Ann. Uh, you, you you said your son and his fiance were. Uh, do you hope they are the next generation taking over the uh, business? We would. We would like for him to. Um, right now, she's she's Scottish. They live in Glasgow, Scotland. So maybe we can. Uh, Maybe we can take our business over to Scotland one of these days. But they, they may come back where we would sure love for them to, absolutely. And okay. I was – oh, go ahead. No, you first. Well, I was just going to say as a sidelight, it turned out after we got the juice business going, we found out that my great-grandfather, who I knew was a grape grower in western New York, also had a juice company, and at the time – of his death in 1898, it was the second biggest in the world after Welch's. And Welch's wound up buying his company out when he passed away. He and Dr. Welch were competitors. And I didn't know anything about that, like I say, until we had been in, until we'd already started this business here. So it would be nice to see it stay in the family. It would be. And back to you. I, Thank you, Don. I know we don't have too much time. Um, you know, we've been talking about the black cherry juice, but you also have these culinary sauces, and it did take those products to the National Restaurant Show um, to introduce the culinary sauces to chefs. What was the reaction, and how are they using that product? It was a really good reaction. They were quite pleased. The reports we got back from the show were quite good. It's It's just a straight reduction of the juice and and they uh can they love it they can further reduce it if they like add balsamic to it and all but it's just it's a nice ingredient it's it's it concentrates the juice it thickens it a bit but it's really good in uh, like as a marinade or pour it over ice cream even just a simple use like that and there again, it's kind of the any anywhere in the meal that, or anywhere in your process of cooking, that you would think it might work. It probably would. And we in the we went to a hospitality show in Vancouver a few years ago, and they took our product. They came around to our booth and got culinary sauce and put it as the secret ingredient in one of the secret ingredients in the BC Iron Chef competition. The British Columbia. Uh, awesome. That's chef. A fantastic thing. Yeah, it's it's it is it's just a re it's kind of you let your imagination take right. you where you want to use it. I know you were talking about the fact that um, you really take the fresh fruit, you know, off off the vine and you know you press it and you make your juice. But I'm thinking that, you know, 50% of the produce aisle, which includes produce and uh, vegetables and fruits, is wasted. And um, do you think there's an opportunity to try to find a way to glean 
that product and make something really useful about uh, useful out of it and you know feed people give kids a better better uh, uh, product to drink that kind of thing have you thought at all in that direction we have thought about it we even looked into that uh, just recently in fact but we checked a couple of stores and I don't know if it's an FDA thing or what, but there's some resistance to the stores giving or, you know, passing that product on to someone else to do something with. Maybe it's a liability thing, but they just said they 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 cannot do that. It's and that happens with a lot of stuff. Not only well, mainly I guess fruit and vegetables because that's the most perishable stuff in the store. But right. it used to be you could get things like that from the store, but now. You say maybe it's a liability insurance issue because they're really reticent to allow somebody to take that that produce and do something with it because it is a, a horrible waste. Absolutely, that's mm. I don't know. I didn't realize it was as high as fifty, but I, I suppose it easily could be because sure. that stuff doesn't last forever sitting there in the store. Oh, we've been talking with Gary Snow. He is is the owner, along with his wife, of Table Tree Montana. Um, it, it is absolutely a, a wonderful product. Gary, your website again? It's Table Tree Juice, and that's the word table and tree juice dot com. T a b l e t r e e juice dot com. Thank you so much for being with us, Gary. It has been a real pleasure. Well, thank you guys, and and like the fellow before me said, you guys are doing great work. It's a wonderful show. I've learned so much just listening to it the last couple of weeks, and oh, wonderful. It, it's inspiring. It, it really is. Thank you, Gary. Remember, you can uh -huh. hear this and every other Food and Wine Insider program on foodandwineerinsider dot com, where you can also take a survey and tell us all about what you want and uh, what you need. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you very much, and you all have a wonderful day. To be successful, most restaurant owners require extra capital from time to time. When you need funding to renovate, buy equipment, or manage cash flow, you don't have time to track down financial statements or wait weeks for a decision. That's where Cabbage can help. Cabbage gives small businesses access to a line of credit of up to $200,000. Apply online and you'll get a decision right away. Since Cabbage is a line of credit, you can take the exact amount you need. You never have to reapply to take additional loans and you'll only pay for the funds you use. Cabbage has helped more than 230,000 businesses from every industry and Four billion dollars in funding, Cabbage is A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and was named the Forbes Top 100 Companies twice in a row. Check out Cabbage at cabbagewithak.com/foodandwine and you'll get a fifty dollar gift card when you qualify. That's k a b b a g e dot com slash foodandwine. Line of credit is subject to credit approval. See terms and conditions. All cabbage business loans are issued by Celtic Bank, a Utah chartered industrial bank, member FDIC. You are listening to Ann Daw and Don Mazella, and the program is Food and Wine Insider. If you have a question or know someone you think our listeners should hear, contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Remember, our programs are heard every Wednesday and Saturday on this station via amfm247.com or on iHeartRadio, as well as Roku Television. You can listen to past shows at foodandwineinsider.com. You know, Anne, I always like publishers who also have a sense of humor and Dave Selden is both. His emails label him as chief janitor and creator, but he's also the creator of the Pocket Rum Diary that helps consumers chronicle cane-based spirit tastings. Now, that's a mouthful, but he's here to tell us all about it. Dave, welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. 
<laughs> well, I appreciate. I love the title. I had an editor that, that uh, whenever I asked him what I should do, he said, "Go wash the windows," and he was so <laughs> right about that. Uh, anyway, uh, with that uh, with that note, I'm going to turn you over to Ann. Sounds Thank great. you, Don, Thank you. And, and welcome, uh, David. As Don said, uh, your title is Creator, Janitor, and Chief Fulfillment Officer for 33 Books. Uh, again, very unusual title. Um, you're a weekend <laughs> home brewer and a beer blogger, and you created a pocket beer tasting no notebook in 2009 so you could write your notes on, on the beers you were tasting. In just a few years, this became your full-time job, and now you have one for rum. So I want to start by hearing a bit about your story before 33 books. Uh, from what I read in your background, you've always had this sort of amazing creative bent. So talk to us uh, pre-33 books. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it is, creativity has kind of been a lifelong, uh, I wouldn't even say really a passion of mine. It's just sort of part of my DNA, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm the happiest when I'm making something, whether that's making bread at home or making beer or, you know, making little notebooks. Um, so yeah, I, I've always been involved in like uh, fine art and other things. Um, and I, uh, when I was in high school, I was introduced to journalism. Uh, I was dating a girl who was a student newspaper editor and she needed some help with some graphic design stuff. I had never basically touched a computer at that point. Um, but I taught myself, um, and uh, from there I kind of started down the journalism path. Um, so I worked with the student newspaper at the University of Iowa, where I majored in journalism. Um, and it was like year two when somebody told me what the starting salary was for a journalist in those days, and uh, it was not very much money. <laughs> and uh, so from there I, I quickly found my way into advertising, and I did that for about, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, mostly interactive stuff, uh, so pixels and websites. Um, and then I just, I really like ink and uh, and paper. I always have. And uh, I did this little book, notebook thing as kind of a side thing. It was a way to kind of use some of those uh, passions um, when I wasn't getting too much of that at my, my day job. So that's, that's, that's it in about 30 seconds. No, no worries. Uh, so what, was the inspiration behind 33 books and why 33? Yeah, I get that question about why 33 a lot. Uh, people see a lot of significance in numbers. It's, it's not something I was really aware of before this. People are always asking if I'm a Mason or if I have some kind of uh, numerology background. And uh, the answer to both of those questions is no. I'm <laughs> just, a, just a guy. Um, uh, my... Uh, the. the genesis of the 33 beers book as you mentioned was kind of related to my beer blogging activities at the time i was uh, writing a beer blog before everybody had one of those um in portland and uh because there weren't too many of us at that in that time i started getting invited by pr people to come cover their events as a writer and um one of the side effects of beer as you may be aware um, and, and many other tasty beverages is that they contain a little mind erasing substance called alcohol. And so I was having a little bit of a hard time remembering the next day what I was uh, supposed to be writing about. And uh, so I made this little notebook uh, for myself to keep notes. Um, and the thing about notebooks is uh, you can't really just print one of them. So I think I printed a 500 or a thousand in that first run and they sold out within a month, which was kind of crazy to me. But that was that was the the start of a business I didn't know I was starting. So the story behind your most recent book, which is on rum, of all interesting things, is quite fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you have to tell us, you have to share with our audience that story, because I guess you really weren't a, a rum drinker per se, but you um, you got sucked in somehow. No, you're right. There's, there's a few of these beverages, like uh, rum is one for sure, tequila and mezcal are another one. Mead is another one for another reason, but... Um, there are these great beverages with a, a, a great history of craft and um, serious people making them and drinking them and making interesting things with them. Um, but they're kind of maligned. And I think the, you know, rum in particular, uh, tequila sort of is in this category, is often judged by a, the first experience you have with rum. And there are a lot of bad rums out there. Um, I have some 
particularly bad memories of a college football game gone wrong. Um, and a lot of people have those kind of experiences um, and, and then are turned off on that spirit um, for, for good, seemingly. Um, but the cool thing about rum is that, um, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. There's so many interesting things um, to experience and so many different flavor profiles um, that, that can be made basically from the same basic ingredient, which is sugar cane um, at, at its base, most base level. Um, everything from cachaça in Brazil, which is like a pretty neutral kind of clean tasting spirit to um, rum agricole and things like that that come from the Caribbean islands that have just a funky um, interesting flavor profile to them that you don't really find in any other um, spirit. So um, how do you sell these books? <laughs> Good question. I'd like to sell more, right? <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're, uh, it's been amazing. Um, as I said, I didn't really know what I was doing when I was starting, and I still am kind of muddling through everything. But um, uh, I, I discovered in, in, I don't know, probably the first year or so that it was a lot easier to sell one person 100 things than it was to sell 100 people one thing. And so uh, the majority of my books are sold to stores, retail stores. Um, uh, and uh, I do sell some on online through my website, and I'm always delighted to do that because it gives me a chance to interact with uh, the people who are using the books directly. And I've made some cool friendships over the years uh, with people that have bought from me on, on my website. But yeah, the majority of them end up in, in stores. Um, and that is a pretty broad category also. Um, so that could be obviously a bookstore, um, but I often end up in, you know, brewery tap rooms or behind the bar um, as I am at uh, a place in Chicago called the Northman, which is where my collaborator on the rum book uh, works. Um, the, the bar is called the Northman and the uh, bar manager name, her name is uh, Ambrosia. And um, she, they, the Northman does a really interesting thing where they uh, use the books as kind of the vehicle for a loyalty program. And they sell the books to the customers. Um, and then the customers, every time they come in, fill out a page or, or two in the book. And when the book is filled up, they get a, a special reward from the bar. Um, the Northman is maybe the best cider bar in the world. Um, and they obviously use my cider books, but they have a very deep uh, cellar full of interesting uh, vintage cider bottles and ciders from Spain and, and France that you really can't find anywhere else. And so um, when you finish a book there, you get a, you get a, a essentially a bottle from, from the, from their cellar, um, which is a pretty cool program. So that's another kind of unconventional place. It's, I'm, I'm a publisher, but I'm a very untraditional publisher, I guess I'll say. <laughs> so have I got this right? You sell the books for $5 each. And I think you're doing this full time. I'm I'm curious as to how you're able to turn a profit and help the family. <laughs> well, I think everybody's you, curious so, about that. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's the sort of the <laughs> name of the game in in America and everywhere else in the world. Um, you know, I, I I work at it pretty hard. I sell a lot of books. Um, is the main thing. Um, I'm just one guy, so my overhead costs are pretty low. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, at the end of the day, I guess it's just paper and ink, right? Um, so it's, those are fairly low cost things and what you do with them is what creates the value. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been my full-time job for the last five years or so. Um, I'm, I'm not driving a Maserati or anything like that, but I, I live pretty well. I have the, the side benefit of, of what I do that I think is pretty awesome is, um, some days when I'm working, I'm, doing a mezcal tasting. Um, some days I'm uh, <laughs> making making beer to practice uh, um, my homebrew book and, and test it. Um, and then as you alluded to early on in, the, in, in this discussion, uh, I also do a fair bit of janitorial work around the, um, around the studio. So everything from bookkeeping to uh, beer brewing <laughs> is, is in my repertoire. But it's a pretty, I, I, like, I like that my days are different every day. You know, Don, before I continue, and I do have lots of questions for David, uh, do you have a question or two for him? Very definitely. Um, you know, publisher, um, uh, I, I was off doing uh, some uh, checking, but I, I guess my question, um, uh, and you might you might have uh, uh, covered it, but uh, how many books do you have in your stable? 
You know, it's it's not a statistic I regularly count, but I just happened to the other day. Um, I think with, with two new books that I'm producing um, this month, or possibly next month, um, I think I'm going to be up to 20 uh, different books. Uh, and then four of those have been translated into Spanish, I guess, depending on how you count it, it's 24. Hmm, that, that's interesting. Well, h how do you go about creating a book? What makes you decide to, to do a, a book? Yeah, it's, that's a process that's kind of evolved over the years. I, um, as when I mentioned, I, I was I started this game as kind of a beer beer person, and that's that's something I, I was already passionate about and knew a fair fair bit about. Um, so for that one, I, I mainly drew on my own knowledge, um, and that was that was pretty true for the first few books. Um, you know, I, I had pretty solid backgrounds in coffee and whiskey and things like that. Um, but as the kind of range has grown, um, I get have gotten into things that I don't know all that much about. Um, mead is a good example, or rum, um, things like that. And uh, I'm fortunate that I live where I live, which is in Portland, Oregon. And uh, this is just a huge foodie town. And so just in my daily life, I interact with people that are um, domain experts in, in all of these things. So I've been I've been really fortunate to be able to um, either use some of those people as collaborators. Um, Ambrosia lives in Chicago, obviously, um, or uh, I, I can you know do some research on on the ground as it, as it were at, at some of the best places in the world to experience you know mead or things like that, and uh, it's, it's just readily available here. So I do a ton of research in terms of just reading things. Um, uh, so I basically buy or, or borrow every book I can find on a subject and, and read it. Um, and so I've gotten a pretty good background in, in most of these things. And then words are great, but you can't really make up for actually experiencing the things. So the best case scenario, I'm able to visit a production site because I think you learn a ton about um, uh, a product, but watching how it's made and, and understanding what, what goes into it and where its flavor comes from. Um, but if you can't do that, then the next best thing is to just taste a lot of it. And, and again, living where I live, it's, it's pretty easy to access um, a broad range of things. I'm, I'm grateful, grateful for that. Well, well let me, do you, t do you accept uh, uh, books from other people who uh, come to you and say, Gee, um, I'm thinking of uh, writing about uh, boysenberries, for instance. <laughs> you know, I, I get a lot of ideas. Um, I, uh, I and more and more, I am doing that. To be honest with you, um, that, it all started with my my oyster book, and uh, I had the reaction I get a lot, um, which is there's 33 different kinds of oysters. That was my first take on it, um, and uh, I as I've learned more and more and more, you know, there's tons and tons of oysters out there. Um, every, every bay or inlet in the world is essentially a new oyster for you to try. Um, even though there's only a few species out there. Um, but the, but the answer is, yeah, I, I do more and more accept those things. I, I try to keep things, um, in the food and beverage world. Um, and even then I'm pretty choosy about what I want to do. Some of that is driven by personal interest because um, I know I'm going to be spending a lot of time consuming that thing. And so if I'm not that interested in, uh, say, 33 Caesar salads, um, it's, it's uh, not that there's anything wrong with Caesar salad. Um, that one is driven more by market, uh, by my perception of what the market for the book would be. Um, but there are other things where I'm just like, yeah, you know, that sounds cool, but it's just not something I really like care that much about at, at the moment. Not to say I wouldn't come back to it, but um, when I get asked oh. about a lot, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, and I'm going to continue a little bit because, as you know, I know uh, I know an awful lot about publishing. Do you uh, do you um, do uh, what, what's called the instant books? And, uh, do you create the books on demand, or or do you do a, pr a press run? How do you do it? Yeah, there, there. I do press runs. Um, I. I would say it's a, almost a hybrid of those two approaches. However, um, I think a lot of traditional publishers, and I'm talking about big ones with New York offices, um, print first runs of things in the tens and even hundreds of thousands of, of books. Um, and I don't, I definitely don't do that. Um, 
oftentimes the first run of a book is a thousand copies um, and sometimes those sit around for a while but um, uh, that's it's, it's a way for me to test the market on something make sure that there is one and, and for everything I've, I've done there has been for the most part um, but um, so it's, it's a little bit of a mix of on demand and um, and uh, hmm. bigger bigger press runs because when I a, a book like my beer book or my whiskey book that are very popular and established books um, I do print multiple thousands at a time and I do that pretty regularly you know it's interesting I was just at book expo and less now um, I was told that less than two percent of all books published have a press runs of initial press runs of a thousand copies or more I was Is shocked by the number I, I, yeah, no, it's, I was. It's, a, yeah. Um, it, uh, and that uh, uh, food related, uh, food and wine related was the third uh, biggest category. Uh, Interesting. Um, uh, anyway, that's. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back to you. I, I, I don't want to uh, monopolize because uh, uh, I, I, I love the. Uh, you know I love the the printed word and, and books, so uh, I, I could go on and on. But I'll go back to you, Ann. Thanks, Don. And no, the questions were great. I think cookbooks are still the biggest uh, selling uh, uh, published uh, product. So um, I'm actually not surprised the things that have to do with food and oh. beverages is, is still something that people want to have a hard copy of. I mean, so much is online now that uh, – you know, people don't don't appreciate as much the the written word. You know, David, you have this wonderful, um, and I did watch it. It's the YouTube video about life by a thousand paper cuts, um, in which you talk about your adventure going from working in a stressful environment to being a small business entrepreneur. I wonder if you could uh, talk to our audience about what some of your key lessons learned are from having come from, you know, a corporate setting to now being uh, an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, the the old joke about working for yourself um, that I think has mostly proven to be true is that you are always working and you are never working. Um, and I, I that's, that's been my, that's my attraction to this. Um, it's, it, it's not always fun. I mean, it's to be on a family vacation and have to take a phone call from somebody about a problem or solve some kind of a shipping dilemma um, when you're supposed to be um, spending time with your family is not always the most fun thing, but by that same token, it's also amazing to um, be able to be home after school when the kids come home and um, have a flexible schedule. So I can be at the soccer games and things like that when I, when I want to be. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, and I, you know, I used to dream about winning the lottery, as most people do. And uh, I realized, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago that, you know, this is my version of the lottery, <laughs> winning the lottery, essentially. Like, how many people uh, get to get to have a job like this where they can, you know, experience so many fun fun flavors and meet interesting people and travel around. Um, so, so that's been pretty awesome. Um, so more, like, practical things, I, as I mentioned, the, uh, the idea of wholesale was not something I was really familiar with, but selling – Selling in mass to a few people for me has been a really good trick, and it's not the only business model, but um, it's one that works well for me and allows me to keep that flexible schedule. Um, the other rules that I've made for myself are um, <laughs> I, I don't look at bank accounts <laughs> after 6 p.m. because I've spent a lot of sleepless nights just thinking about stuff that really isn't that important, but uh, it, <laughs> it kind of puts your mind in a in a bad place. Um, uh, that's maybe not good advice for everybody, but for me, it, it seems to keep my, my mental health a little better in check. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, take time to make coffee. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, it's easy to just go through your day and tackle a to-do list one item after another, but you have to take care of yourself too and have, have a little downtime to reflect on the day. So that's, that's something I try and remember to do a couple times a day anyway. <laughs> incredibly supportive. Um, where have you gotten your support and how has it helped you? Yeah, I mean, definitely my family has been supportive. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the main thing. Um, to, I, 
I quit my day job um, making uh, <laughs> most six figures um, in advertising uh, right around the birth of my second child, um, which is a pretty <laughs> pretty bold thing to do. Um, but my wife didn't really bat an eye, and um, she said, well, I, you know what's best for you, and uh, I'm glad you'll be able to take time off and be with our family. And, um, you know, it's just been that that support has been incredible. Um, I, and again, I'm super lucky to have that because I know that's not everybody's um, situation. Um, thankfully, I kind of like, you know, waltzed into this uh, slowly, but um, so I had a little bit of success on the on the book, so to speak. But um, that, that's a big part. Um, I, I'm, you know, growing up, my, my family was also really supportive. My mom and dad were also great about uh, I come from a family of accountants and math people uh, for the most part, and uh, the weird kid who liked art more than sports and, and, <laughs> and numbers. Uh, you know, I, I was pretty fortunate to have a family that supported me in, in those activities. Um, so I don't know. But it's, I've been really lucky in, in those respects, too. Wonderful. If, if you had anything to do over again, what would it be? That's a great question. I don't spend a whole lot of time looking backwards. Uh, again, see that earlier comment about my my mental health. But um, you know, honestly, I think I would have I would have quit my day job sooner. Um, it's it's a, a hard, very very hard decision to make, particularly if you have a family. But um, my realization was that I would come to success with this endeavor more quickly if I devoted more attention to it, and um, that kind of trying to split your time half and half or, or whatever it is um, uh, was, was really putting the brakes on, on the success of this, this activity. Um, and, and again, it, it's hard to know that, that, that timing is, is different for everybody. Um, but I think I would be uh, maybe, maybe a little further along than I am now. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at, of course, but um, you know, you, you wonder what opportunities you might've missed by, <laughs> devoting it to yeah, I uh, think it's, other activities. It, I think it's actually a very brave thing to do. I mean, because as you're saying, it's kind of a scary thing to do. Um, and so if you wanted to give advice to a budding entrepreneur in the food or beverage or wine or spirits business, what would it be? Uh, What's your one piece I of mean, advice? <laughs> little little experiments probably. Um uh, that idea of just trying something and 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 making sure that there's a market for it. Um, I, I see a lot of businesses come and go that um, have a narrow focus and um, try and start too big. And um, I'm all for ambition, but um, I think it's wise to make sure there's a, a market for something before you go all in on it. Um, and so if there are ways that you can, as you're deb debuting or working on a new product, start with a small batch or start with a small number of things or start with a um, uh, a few retail partners rather than trying to dive into a huge one um, mm -hmm. or lots and lots of them. Um, I think just, just to kind of get your, that's a, it's a good way to get your feet wet and, and figure out what the problems are before you, um, before you dive in head first and <laughs> find yourself uh, over your head. That was a Fantastic. couple of mixed metaphors, but they were both aquatic. So I think that works. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Don because we've run out of time, though I would love to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. It was well, nice chatting with you. Well, Dave, we've been talking with Dave Selden. He, he's uh, uh, the publisher, chief um, uh, chief janitor. Uh, Dave, your website again for, for people and your publishing company? Yeah, it's 33books.com and uh, in no way related to the Masons. Well, Dave, it's been a pleasure. You, uh, a link to your website will be on foodandwineinsider.com tonight where you can hear this program and every other food and wine program. And you can also give us some feedback by, by taking our short survey. Dave Selden, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me and for everything you guys are doing. It's really important work you've done. Thank you, Dave. You've been listening to Food and Wine Insider with Ann Daw and Don Mazella. 
Want to join us on a future show? Contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Until next time, have a passion for food, wine, and profits, and think of our program, Food and Wine Insider. <laughs>